Dave, a good sermon. Uh, thanks for sharing the ministry of the mulch team. That's good. Uh, we're moving to the, the second sermon of the day, and uh, during the invitation, you can respond to either one as we move here. Thank you. None of us like to be fooled, and each of us come to a place in our life and ask that question, what can I trust? And we come in our own language, but it gets down to this, what is most true is most real. If it's not true, it doesn't have a sustainable reality. It will reveal itself uh, to be a pretender. Uh, the name for Satan is actually the deceiver. And so what is most true has legs. What, what is most true is from the heart of God. When, when it was said of God that God is love, and love cast out fear, perfect love. God, God directed love. God empowered love has the capacity to cast out fear. And fear has a way of distorting for us reality, pretending to be something that it's not. God wants you to know truth and reality. He loves you so much that he only wants your life to be organized around his very presence. And so how do we center ourselves in an uncentered world by leaning into uh, God's truth uh, and reality? We, we've all been hit from current events that we're wondering, where did that come from? And uh, we're wondering... Who, who's in charge and how are these things going to work out? Uh, the problems that have created a mess and we find ourselves living through the mess and we can get anxious and uh, uh, Michelle, my daughter-in-law, put it this way, a friend had shared with her that said when you get to your 30s, you don't need to set the alarm clock anymore uh, because the problems will wake you up at 4 a.m., you know. It, it's, it's the sins that things are just askew. And so what do we do? Well, that's where the story that Debbie helped us and where the Pettis children read so powerfully, it is the story of, of two people, uh, Cleopas and another not identified. It may have been his wife, Mary, uh, identified in John 1925, who was at Calvary, the crucifixion of Christ. But these two are headed home to Emmaus, which is a, a term for the warm springs. And as they're on this seven-mile journey, uh, they're talking among themselves. They're leaving Jerusalem. They're not staying in Jerusalem because that's where the problem was. Something had happened there they couldn't make sense of. Uh, the one they thought truly was the Messiah who would redeem uh, all the world had been crucified by the power brokers of Rome and their own religious leaders. Uh, they had seen his uh, nails, they'd seen his uh, pierced hands uh, with their own eyes. They had watched his body be buried into the grave. And, but it was the third day, it was the third day, and on that third day the story was by women disciples that... Uh, the strange had happened. It's seemingly too good to be true that Christ had risen. And so they're talking among themselves, and whoop, up comes Jesus. <laughs> up from the grave he arose, and along the road he came. And right in their midst, like a fulfillment of a teaching that he had given, that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, what? There am I in the midst of them. And in the power of this... He asked three questions. They asked two questions. Five of the 3,300 questions asked in the Bible are found in this passage. You got questions for God? The intriguing fact is that most of the questions asked in the Bible are asked by God of us. <laughs> God wants to know if we know the answer. God wants to know if we know that we don't know the answer, but we can find the answer. And God wants us to know that he is the promise maker who is the promise keeper. And so Jesus pretends incognito, he pretends that he doesn't know, and that's where the story unfolds. Now, how do we see reality? How do we see this truth revealing reality? Well, if we only looked at the crosses at Calvary, what we would see would be three crosses. Uh, the bodies had been taken down, and there were three crosses remaining, as though the, the shame emblem of the Roman Empire had won. That's what the cross meant then. But if we see it from a God's vantage point, 
as each of us can take the view in of our lives and our world as God is seeking to show us, well, then it all comes into view. It becomes framed then by the, the open tomb. And through that reality that God has the power to overcome all, then we become a people who, who are heirs in a living relationship with this same Christ, that we then are a people who win as we live in the promises of God. So we do this, leaning into uh, God's, re God's truth to know his reality in our daily life. Our life with our sin to be forgiven, the life of our finances, the life of our calendar, the life of our school, the life of our relationships, the life of does she or does he love me or not, the life of family problems and stress, the life can I get through whatever that press is painful on our soul. We can believe. We can believe, we can believe that the truth of Christ is how we know the reality of Christ. We believe, that's an action that we can do. We, as we believe then in this Christ, we experience the reality of the Christ. Bobby and Julie in a few minutes will give their living testimony of their lives, leaning into this reality. And for everyone, the, the water is open. It's just fine. It's the sign of the the resurrection. It's a sign of the open tomb. It, it's a sign that when we come from the water, the inward decision has already been made, but we're telling the story that up from the grave he rose and up from the water we arise to walk in a new life. That's believing. That we walk and talk in awareness that God is with you, Emmanuel. And then Jesus would say, avoid the foolishness of a slow heart, of an unwilling heart. Because belief will heal. Well, the passages that get at this story in Luke 24 kind of show themselves out as he came and was with them. And then verse 16 may have intrigued you through the years, kind of puzzled you, scratched your head and asked, what is this? But they were kept from recognizing him. Well, what was that? Well, first they were in deep grief. It's been hard for you to, to take in hope and promise when you're in the midst of, of sadness, overwhelming sadness, the kind of sadness that makes you ask, can I ever, ever believe again? And then in light of that deep sadness, some good news comes, but the good news is so bewildering, it's hard to accept that it actually is real. And so they couldn't recognize Christ in their midst. And before we, before we kind of shake our finger at them, Unless you're a Baylor Bear and you're still raising this finger, you know, out here. But unless you're, sh you know, you, before we shake our finger at them, we have to realize that at least for Les Holland, it's very true. I would have been right where they were. And so the Lord says to us, watch your, your slow heart to believe. Take your hurts and let believing then actually heal them. And so he, he revealed for them again all the stories from Genesis to Malachi. He revealed to them all that he had been teaching, which was the fulfillment of all the Hebrew scriptures. And in the midst of that is this promise that's true. We're, we're going to have this National Day of Prayer right here on a, the Thursday morning on May the 6th. The, the mayor of our city will be speaking about why he prays and how he prays. Um, we'll, we'll have a, a message from a dear friend friend, Stephen Guto, a rabbi from uh, New York University who knows our commitment to the Messiah, will answer that same question. And in the midst of this, our Archbishop Gustavo, dear friend, will come and also say, in times like these, how have we been praying? We can see what is most real because it is most true. And the scriptures reveal this power of the story. Well, God knows that I got a problem and you got a problem. And that is we've all been hurt in life. We've all been disappointed in life. And in doing so, there's a fancy new word that comes out of old words. It's a fancy new word that has actually three words, all that show up in the New Testament. Uh, they're the Greek words. And if you have a hard time trusting people, you can always throw this word out, uh, that you have pistanthrophobia. Uh, pist is the first word of pisteo, which means trust or believe. Anthro is the word of 
people and phobia of course we all know that one that's what we're afraid of it's the it's the fear of trusting people again when people have disappointed us we've all know that ache in the heart and yet Jesus comes to heal not only our relationship of a sin sick life made whole shame lifted from us by the power of believing that in him as the Christ but he has the power like Zacchaeus coming down from the sycamore tree he has the power to heal our human relationships he has the power for us to get outside of chat rooms and Facebook accusations and to say there's something more going on in our relationship than fussing with each other. And in this, we can be a healer, uh, like we're joining into the conversation as two people on the way to Emmaus and Christ shows up. Well, we can observe we can observe and we can reason and we can experience. That is, we take in what is true and determine whether it's real. We, we observe it. We see it. We taste it. We touch it. We hear it. We smell it. We observe it. And then we reason. We try to connect the dots of what this is. And then we experience it. We take it in. And God's reality by living in his promises comes alive for us as we live in these promises of Observing, reasoning, and then experiencing them. We can't get there otherwise. That my favorite, you know, philosopher that Vicky wouldn't let me name one of her children, Soren. I uh, got to name the dog Soren that we had for a long time. And Soren Kierkegaard, a courageous believer, said he's the one who made famous that phrase, the leap of faith into the reality of God. And then he said, a truth which is true for me. We all search for a truth which is true for me, and the truth that is true for us, he knew and we know, becomes real for us as we lean into this Christ. Not afraid, it, it heals us. Now, the story then out of this power of the Lucas, and it says, um, they were good enough to say, something's going on inside of us. In worship today, something's going on inside you that the Lord is calling you to a next intimacy, a next tenderness, a next trust with him. Something's going inside you that's calling. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're stiff-arming God. And some of the biggest decisions I've made in faith, I first was angry as all get out. And then I asked myself the question, why am I so angry? And the answer typically has been, because God is asking for a change in my life, and I have to trust him with a deeper belief and more radical courage than I've ever had before. And so it was that he was, they, they knew something was going on. And so when they arrived to their home, Cleopas and maybe his wife Mary, when they got to the home, they said, don't, don't leave us because we want, we want to host you to a meal. And then Jesus was not the guest at the table. He, he was at his rightful place. He was at the host of the table. And so when he took the bread there, he, 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 he took it and he broke it and he gave thanks for it and then he gave it to them. And then, and then say it with me. How does 31 open, verse 31? Then their eyes were opened. What opens your eyes to see God's truth and know his reality? And from that story, it came alive. One of the heroes in my life is Taylor Gleason. Gleason. Taylor uh, was baptized in October of 2009. Uh, and then sometime after that, he made a bad decision that sent him to prison. And what has he done in prison? But he has known then the full reality of the power of this Christ whom he trusted as Savior, would commit to follow his Lord, came from the baptismal waters, wasn't applying all the promises that came with that. But see, the good news of God is that his grace just goes with us wherever we go. But we've got to trust him to have that grace to be assimilated, working within our life with the courage. And so while he has been in a state penitentiary since 2013, he has grown as a follower of Christ. He is the truth of God stirs inside him. And in the power of that, what he does with our radio ministry at 8.30 on Sunday morning at the, the prison there in Cuero is he'll gather some of his fellow friends 
who are inmates to listen to my radio message and have prayer and a Bible study. Because what Taylor knows is that wherever we are in life, the grace of God is most true and therefore most real and they can cause us to build our best life. And you see his report card? I'm not sure I put all my report cards on the screen. But he's got straight A's except for introductory chemistry. And if I think I had a, maybe a D in my introductory, he got a B. And as he's learning his skills and abilities, and not only is he preparing for life when he's released from prison, which I pray will be sooner than what the sentence was, we will be there when he is out, won't we? In 2023, we pray. We will be there and with a new beginning. Because what happens to felons, even felons who have been transformed, is they are not given uh, a trust level unless there are people who have a courage to give a trust level of a new beginning. See, this is hard reality. But there is no reality that is harder than the truth of God. And trusting in that has creates a transformation. As Catherine is here this morning, Catherine, are you here? You are, there you are. Ray, stand up. Raise your hand. This is Taylor's mom, Catherine, who herself is a courageous person. Well, you take our greetings back to Taylor. All right. All right. This is a grandmother here, Leah, who was a wonderful writer and so believed in her grandson. See, this, we hang together. We, we, we are in this together. That's the reality. And then... As we, we believe in order to be healed, and as we observe and reason and experience, then we come to the power of sharing. Uh, that we don't just keep it to ourselves. We take it out and we share it. Even as Samantha Joy, last Sunday, came up from the waters and she raised her arm and was capturing a photograph, and there's the story. We are made victors. Right there, Samantha Joy. Yeah, stand up, Samantha Joy. Yeah. Whew. All right. Because what, these, what Cleopas did and his companion is they didn't walk back to Jerusalem and to the upper room where the other disciples and believers were hunkering down, fearing for their lives. They ran back. And when they arrived, their first words were this, it is true, the Lord is risen. And then they throw, use a phrase that seems like a throwaway phrase. So what Simon said is true too. Well, why is that? Simon had been the lead apostle. He's the one who said he would never, ever deny Christ, but he denied Christ three times when Christ was crucified. Three times. He had lost credibility. But Christ said, I will have already prayed for you, Simon, because I know the weakness of your character. I know that's what you will do, but I want you to know that my prayers will be there to reach you in your failure so that you'll be lifted up from the shame and that you can again rise to the potential, to the reality of who I know you to be. And so Simon gets lifted up in this witness, in this story. I pray that you do that for people, don't you? You're able to speak the encouragement of truth into people's lives that they can know that this truth is a reality that God provides for them. And when they did, well, the story has an exclamation mark. Christ showed up in their midst for everyone in the upper room to see with their own eyes at the same time. There are times in when I'm having visions, <laughs> and in the visions, I can, I'll be in a worship experience with you. And I'll picture Jesus walking in. And then Jesus is seated by, let's just say, he's seated in by that chair next to John and with Julie. And then all of a sudden, he pops over here, and he's seated right here. And there's another. And, there's, and all of a sudden, Jesus is seated next to everybody because that's the reality in this vision that I have at times in worship. This is the Christ who is with us. And this is the Christ who is most true and most real and therefore is the power to make your life most real by being a person of the truth and the gift of salvation.